Well, once again, I am so thrilled to invite to our podcast stage, Alyssa Dameron, therapist, friend, um, event, uh, giving of herself at our events and Thriveivers so that others can learn from her. And we had an amazing event recently on suicide ideation. And so I thought, oh, this would be such a good podcast. Why don't, uh, why don't I get Alyssa to come back and and talk to us a little bit more about this very important subject and something that I think all too often many of us don't really even know where to start. Like, what are we looking for? What do we do if we feel like somebody is in danger? All of the things that I know I have thought to myself when there have been times where somebody will say something, and I'm like, does this mean I should call the police? Does this mean I should be calm and just listen? What does this mean? And so I really want to welcome you back to the show, Alyssa, and thank you for being here. Yes, I'm always happy to be a guest on the podcast and within the Thrive Ivers community. It's always an honor. Well, thank you. You're amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I think it's, I always think it's funny that this is like a insight into Alyssa's head, and I'm sure probably other people can recognize that, that it's sometimes scary when you're considered the expert. <laughs> Like, oh, I'm an expert in something now. That seems like a lot of weight. Yeah, and it is kind of, isn't it? Because, you know, especially when you're talking about something as important as this, where what do we, how do we recognize? Um, I mean, obviously, there are times when even in my own life, I have had those kinds of thoughts when I've been really, really low. And I've felt like no matter what I do, there's no hope. Things aren't going to change. I'm going to be stuck here in this situation or in this state of mind. And you really, when it gets to the point of complete despair and apathy, there have been a couple of times in my, in my life, in my adult life, where I really um, had thoughts. I had, I mean, I, I can even share one time when I was down in the basement of this house where I do the podcast from. And I had a bottle of, um, you know, they were like pain pills. You know, they weren't mine. Um, and I thought, maybe I'll just be done with the pain of it all, with, the, with all the feelings that I was feeling and all of the seemingly insurmountable um, problems and issues that I was experiencing and laying on the floor in a basement with no windows, just a storage room and laying on the cold, hard cement floor. It had a little indoor outdoor kind of carpet, but I just, I just laid there for hours. I could hear people calling my name upstairs, which was probably a good thing. Um, but it was one of those moments where I just was like, why do I keep trying? Why am I doing this? This isn't at all like how I expected my life to be at this point. And, um, you know, I had my son. I had stepdaughters that were very important to me that I was a, a part of their life. I had a marriage. I had, I had a home. I had many good things in my life. But that's where I was at in that moment. And I just wonder how, how, I, how I could have either prevented having that moment or if there might have been some tools. And I know you're going to kind of present this whole thing in your own way, but I wanted, I wanted it to be personal for those listening that as happy and as cheerful and as positive as I am as a human being, generally speaking, in my life and because of, you know, having parents who help me see the glass is half full, not half empty, and that every day is a bonus and all of those things that all the sayings and the phrases that my dad said, which have saved my life many times. And talking to my, my sister Karen, who needs a kidney transplant, and how low and, and sick and sad and hard it is in the state of her health at this time, how she was just like, if I, if I can't feel better, I just can't see why I would want to stick around, even though I have all these, you know, beautiful grandkids and my children and my wonderful husband and my wonderful life. 
I can't imagine it sometimes. And we were talking about our dad. And then I mentioned it to Susan when she was here visiting last night and the conversation that Karen and I had had. And she said, well, it's true. Those phrases have saved our lives. Those phrases really have. Those little sayings that dad said 10 times a day have come to mind at some of our lowest moments. And that's exactly where kind of Karen and I ended our conversation because she said, well, just got to remember every day is a bonus, you know, and then we laughed through our tears, through our pain, through our sadness. And Susan and I talked about it last night about that conversation that I had had because it was my sister's birthday, Karen's birthday. And we were like, maybe it's just as, as simple as that to have a phrase <laughs> A, something to say, you know, <laughs> when you are just, when you're able to almost break the ice for yourself. And that was kind of what, you know, that's where we, we got to in those two conversations with my two wonderful sisters that aren't we lucky that we grew up with, you know, a, a mother who was so even-tempered and, and sweet and kind and, and agreeable and a father who was constantly putting in our minds one or two or ten of his famous what seemed like silly sayings because of the way he said them, but they really did impact our lives. So anyway, I'm going to stop talking now about this and let you analyze me. <laughs> help me or help others on this podcast who might be help listening to people. say, how do we do this? How do we get through these darkest days when they are health-related things that don't look like they're going to change, when they are, you know, your life's situation that you thought would be so different and it may not change, you know? You may not get married or you might be divorced and you may not find the forever that you thought you would have. You may have, you know, a number of reasons why you could have those dark, dark days, just even having gone through abuse they come up and you don't even know necessarily why. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I really like what you said about how we're laughing through our tears, like we're saying these, phrase, these phrases through our tears. And I think sometimes when we're going through challenging times, it's hard for us to think about joy or think about laughter or sometimes to even, like sometimes people feel guilty feeling happy in sad moments or hard moments. Mm -hmm. um, and within the therapy community, right, we kind of talk about polarized thinking, right? A lot of people get stuck in the either or it's this or that. It has to be this or that, because if it's not this or that, I don't know how to function. But mm -hmm. as someone goes through therapy, our goal is to expand that and rather it be a world of this or that, it's a world of this and that. And you can have multiple conflicting things exist in the same moment. And you can laugh through the tears and cry in sad moments, too. Um, and so it really, it doesn't have to be that dichotomy of this or that. And oh, that's powerful. powerful. And. We live in a world of what? Ands. This and that. And. and. Ooh, that's good. <laughs> okay. That's what I, I always try to teach that to people that I work with is, it's not this or that, it's this and that. And that's okay. And it can feel uncomfortable, but that's okay. Yeah, in fact, it's a favorite line of mine. I did the play, uh, played Malin in Steel Magnolias. Uh, I did it a couple of times. I've done that show. And Trudy, the, the hairdresser, the one that Dolly Parton played, you know, of course, we know that there's a, a pretty sad, you know, ending of... of Sally Field when her daughter, you know, dies, and that's the part I was playing, and she goes through this huge, you know, kind of tirade, like, it should have been me. Your your children aren't supposed to die before you do, and, you know, and all these things, and how she wanted to, you know, save her, and she, you know, had had the surgery and all of that, and it's still, but, you know, it got rejected, and and she, you know, the daughter dies, and as she yells and, you know, and all of her best friends that are sitting there in the hair salon are listening and she's having a complete breakdown. There was a moment, you know, where Trudy says to her, something, something someone says, 
Oh, it was, oh, it's, oh, I know what it is. It's where, it's where one of the other ladies pulls Weezer. Weezer, who's the curmudgeon you know, kind of always negative person. She goes, well, go here, here, hit Weezer. Hit, hit her. Go ahead, hit her. You know? And they grab her and go ahead, hit Weezer. And Weezer's like, what are you talking about? Get your hands off me. And anyway, the way that that unfolds is it just breaks the ice. And all of them start laughing, including Malin, who's so sad and devastated that her daughter has died and left behind this little baby. And, you know, it's just such a, a sad, sad thing. But once they all start laughing, Trudy just takes her by, the, by, by her shoulders and she says, you know, laughter through tears is my favorite emotion. And I love that line, laughter through tears sometimes has to be our favorite emotion. Yes. That's life. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So to start, I figured we could maybe discuss suicide in general, and then we'll talk about um, ways to help ourselves and others. I love that. So when I presented in the Thrive Vibers community, um, I came upon this quote as I was preparing my presentation and it's from an anonymous source, but it says, people do not die from suicide. They die from sadness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's so challenging about suicide and something that we really struggle is people to understand when we're on the side of losing someone to suicide is that ultimately it was somebody's choice, right? It wasn't a car accident. It wasn't an ill, it wasn't a medical illness. It wasn't um cancer diabetes or a heart a heart attack or a stroke or you know whatever whatever the causes of so many tragic things are it was emotional it was mental health it was mental like aspects of mental illness and those are things that are really hard for us as human beings to grasp that from the outside especially if you've never felt those things to understand how somebody could get to that point but it's true they don't die from suicide they die from sadness their emotions and mental health are what ultimately ended their lives and I think that's tragic to think about on a human to human level that somebody could be in that space um, to want to die and then do something about it absolutely oh my gosh that's really true they don't die by suicide they die by sadness by loneliness by some kind of feeling that there's no hope that is, that is really powerful. Yeah. So what are, when you're saying, let's talk about the general, um, general suicide in general, what, what do you mean exactly? Yeah. So breaking down statistics, right. And I think that education of suicide is, is just as important as, as the, what you do about suicide, right. I yeah. think we need to educate people on how prevalent this is and has become in our society. Um, hmm. Suicide is among the leading causes of death in the United States. It's not the top, but it's among the leading, and that is pretty tragic. Um, wow. Death by, so all my information kind of that I'm presenting today comes from the CDC website, Center for Disease Control, hmm. but they they speak to a lot of health-related things and public health-related things. Um, so they've done a lot of studies on suicide. And 2020 is the most recent that they had, like, specific data. So it's definitely changed. Um, I don't know what the 2023 or even 2022, I don't know what that um, trend is. But from 20 to 21, it was still an upward trend of increasing suicides. And my guess is that we're probably still in an up in an increase in trends. So in 2020, death by suicide was approximately 13.5 people for every 100,000. So that's a pretty significant amount. Um, in 2020, the suicide rate among males was four times higher than females. Wow. So we know that men have a higher chance of completing suicide. And we'll kind of break down why that is in a minute. And among females, the suicide rate was highest for those ages 45 to 64, whereas among males, it was 75 and older. So older men are more likely to complete suicide 
and middle-aged women are more likely to complete suicide. Wow, that's interesting too. Yeah, and I think that goes to show what happens as people age and the emotions that people feel, loneliness, hopelessness, as their bodies start to break down. Your sister talking about being in physical pain is huge, right? As someone's body starts to go, as someone's mind starts to go, as loved ones start to die, as, as kids move out, as you don't have visitors as often, you don't have that community, it's hard. Mm-hmm. It's hard to live life alone. I know we talked about this a couple podcasts ago. Maybe it was the last podcast I was on with you. I can't remember at this point, but um, the importance of community, right? Yes. And how vital community is, not just for healing from trauma, but for just survival in general. Like human beings are not meant to be loners and to be alone. We don't thrive that way. Even introverts need to have people in their lives that they can mm-hmm. communicate with and feel heard and feel understood and all of those things. Well, it makes total sense to me because sometimes I think I would be a hermit or I would be a person that is, you know, I seem to be super like extroverted and I love people, but at the same time, I would choose probably to be alone and introverted more often. But because I have people around me, they keep me from doing that. And it's a much better existence, even though sometimes people think, well, I just prefer to be alone. I'm like, well, do you really? (laughs) You know, it's interesting. I do think community is so huge. And I think that, that we have lost a lot of that just because we live in a world that doesn't have to commune in person. We can just do it through a text or something. And that doesn't seem to be the same to me as being face to face with a friend or a family member or even a neighbor, you know, to go outside on your lawn. And, and, you know, we used to fly kites in this neighborhood and everybody would come out and we'd all sit on our lawn and all of our different kids would, you know, make sure everybody had a kite. And, you know, it was just events like that, that I'm like, I don't see anybody doing that. I guess all the kids are gone now from the neighborhood, you know, and it's like, when do you sit and talk to your neighbors? Uh, how do you reach out? Because having community matters. It does for sure for me. I agree. I was listening to this other podcast and they were talking about their like dream home life situation. And they're, I want to say they're late 20s, early 30s, uh, two women. And one says, I just want to live in like a place where I know my neighbors and we bring each other casseroles and treats or whatever. Um, and the other girl goes, does that exist anymore? And they're like, I don't know. Does it? And I think that's a fair question. <laughs> does it exist anymore? I mean, I don't know my neighbors. Like I, yeah. as I drive out, like I'll wave, but I don't know them by name. Yeah. What happened to the neighborhood party? Or yeah. I guess it's up to me. It's up to me to organize one of those. Mm-hmm. It's up to me to go knock on the door and go, I don't really know you. And I should, because you're my neighbor, you know, just. Yeah. It's 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 a different world. It's harder to reach out. And of course, we're more, you know, maybe we're more cautious or too cautious, not too cautious, but you know what I mean? You want to know who's around you. You got to actually have some effort, some skin in the game to do that. You know, you actually have to do something, which yeah. is we're busy and it's hard to do, but I do think it it really does end up mattering, you know. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. So the statistics are pretty high for suicide for different ages um, between 20. So the even though like for women, for example, the highest um, rate for suicide is ages 45 to 64. That's right. I'm referencing my sheet here because I don't know where things anymore. <laughs> but nice. even between 20 and 21, the ages between 10 and 14 increased in suicide. So we're seeing this increase in teens and young adults at every age. It just is so prevalent and it's, it's so becoming more prevalent at younger and younger ages. And I think there's a lot of factors with that, but I think exposure is a big one. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot more exposure to suicide. There's a lot more. It's talked about, and I think it's a double-edged sword. It's important to talk about suicide. We have to talk about it. You have to ask the questions. Um, but 
there's also that concern about people learning about what suicide is before they have a con- an understanding of what death is, right? Yeah. I'll see um, a 10-year-old in the ER who says he wants to die and maybe has even tried to do something to end his life, but he has zero concept of what death is. Wow. And but the thought of exposure, right? right? Yeah. yeah. And so it's definitely concerning because, like I said, it's something we need to talk about. We have to talk about it. It's one of the talking about it is one of the things that keeps people safe. But a 10 year old doesn't even know that suicide is an option until someone teaches them that. Right. That's not how a brain is wired. And so we have a lot more people growing up with the notion of suicide. Uh, And being exposed to suicide is actually a risk factor. If you have someone in your life who you know um, personally who died by suicide, it increases your, it doesn't increase your risk, but it is a risk factor because now you know that suicide is, a, is an option for you. Wow. Um, I could say. So what yeah. would you say, how would you, you know, if you were to counsel a parent, you know, or a grandparent, you know, because it feels like at 10, like I definitely remember several stories in the news that were just heartbreaking, um, whether it was generally, it felt like it was bullying. That, that was, oh, absolutely. And, you know, that was the the thing. I don't know. Um, and probably, you know, that's definitely a form of abuse. Bullying is is a terrible thing, but it seems like it's worse when it comes from your peers mm-hmm. almost to like yeah. that is the thing so do most 10 year olds have a phone now do most of them get exposed to it just because so don't you want to be like the first teacher but wh- how much do you say in order for it not to be like this is an option I mean that's yeah. really interesting I hadn't thought of that I think it starts with other conversations beforehand and I think this is something we've also talked about on the podcast, that part of it is is creating an environment where you have open communication with your children or your grandchildren or the people in your life, where when they have questions, you're the person they want to come to because they know that they'll get an answer from you and that they know that they'll get an accurate answer from you. Whereas if you say, you're too young for me to talk to you about that, it doesn't change their curiosity. They're going to go find the answer. But do you want it to be from you or somebody else? Um, And so creating that culture of open communication where you're talking about everything brings in the opportunity for when hard things come up. Yeah, because it feels like so often we avoid those kind of subjects because Mm -hmm. either we don't know what to say, we don't know if we should say certain things, you know, and I think it's interesting because they're going to most likely by the age of 10, 11, 12, have a phone, have experiences at school with either themselves or others watching bullying happen or or more severe things than what I think I maybe dealt with. I mean, I dealt with some very severe things, but it wasn't it wasn't because my peers and my and my my whole life was in my hand, you know, was Mm -hmm. this thing that I can find out about everything and that everything is coming to me, whether I want to know or not, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that is a really interesting, you know, thinking about how I would talk to a grandchild or to, you know, a young person that trusted me or that asked me a question. Is it the staying calm? Because we talked about that part and that calm um, not having some, why are you asking me that? You know, that would be yeah. a knee jerk reaction that would cause that child to shut down that they're okay. Never mind, Cause that's upsetting to you. And that's not how we want to do it. So, yeah. okay. So calm being curious, I think is really helpful. You know, when a kid comes and asks, when your child comes and asks you, mom, or dad or grandma, what is suicide? Tommy at school said that his dad killed himself by suicide. What does that mean? Um, be, be curious. 
oh, that's really hard. What did Tommy tell you? You know, ask for the details. Oh, that sounds really, you know, validate. That sounds really scary. Yeah. And just explain it, right? And there's actually a lot of information online about um, how to talk about death or homicide or suicide at a developmental level for children. You can actually just Google it. And there are quite a few great websites. Maybe we could find a way to post some of those resources um, within your network, Jen. But yeah, that would be great to have it on our website and to also have it in the Thriveivers community where yeah. it will be easy access to find some really good information that you feel, you know, this is solid yeah. depending on how old that child is, exactly. you know? Exactly. Yeah. And I think, you know, talking about sometimes people's emotions get really intense and they don't know how to handle them and they do something to end their lives. And that's really scary, huh? Um, and then asking a question, like as and we'll kind of talk about what some of maybe the signs are later. But if you start noticing changes in your kids or in your family members or the people around you, ask, right? Be curious. And you don't have to, you know, it's that same thing. Be calm about it because you don't want to come off as like this negative emotional reaction. But mm hi, -hmm. I'm concerned about you. You know, I'm wondering, like, sometimes people in these situations get so tired that they... They don't want to be here anymore. Or, you know, they wish they could go to sleep and not wake up. Is that, have you ever had that thought? Yeah. Okay, tell me more about that. Sounds like you have. Be curious and ask the direct questions. And you can phrase things differently to a 16-year-old. You might say, let's talk about it. Like, have you had any thoughts of suicide? You know, whereas a, yeah. to a nine-year-old, you might say, have you had any thoughts of not wanting to be here anymore? not wanting to be alive anymore. So the language you, you use might change depending on the age you're talking to, but the open communication is, is the biggest part for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's very helpful. Okay, so, so as we see suicide increasing in that younger population, I'm very curious, like, why men over the age of 75 that's such an interesting statistic that that is the largest suicide rate is among men for men over the age of 75. Is that what you said, right? Yeah, as of 2020, that is the case okay. that I was above the age of, of 75. I think as a couple of things, like I think retiring is hard. It's hard for anybody. Um, loss of spouse, loss of family, um, growing older, not being able to function. Your body doesn't function the way it used to. There's a lot of loneliness, a lot of hopelessness. You're on the decline of your life. The, the ways that you found meaning. Um, and with this current generation, I mean, who knows how it will change in the coming decades. But with this current generation of people that are 75, meaning and value came from work right? I am meaningful because I provide, I work, I do these things. So then when somebody retires and how they filled themselves and found self-esteem and self-confidence and all of those things over the years with that growing generation doesn't exist anymore. They don't have that. And so it's who am I? What am I? What's my purpose here anymore? I don't have a purpose anymore. I might as well just die. Yeah, I've you know, I can see that um, caring for my my mother, you know, and now that my father has passed, you know, there is very challenging moments where, you know, what, I don't want you to have to worry about me or take care of me, you know, and so I can see that that does make a lot of sense, you know, where people really feel that way and how, how do you regain purpose when you can't do the things you used to do or you aren't working anymore because, you know, you you really can't work in the same way. You know, mom was a social worker, but she can't do that kind of work now, you know. And so it is interesting to be very aware of the people in your life as at these different ages and stages of life to know this one's, this is hard. This is hard for somebody, you know, yeah. and how can I reach out? How can I be aware? How can I be more um, just 
in tune with yeah. what they might be feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I think that goes back to even just how, like talking with your kids. Be curious about the people in your lives. Ask questions, right? It's that building of community. We give it to other people. Other people give it back to us. And, and that's how we that's how we can thrive in our lives at every stage is, is to be curious and ask people genuinely, how are you? And don't just settle for the, oh, I'm fine. You know, ask different yeah. questions. Tell me how today was. What have you been happy about lately? What have you struggled with lately? Yeah, it sounds like that's been a lot. You know, your wife died last year. It's probably been a really hard year. What, it, what has helped you? You know, and if you start to notice that people are saying like all negatives and no positives, then start asking the questions. OK, so I'm hearing a lot of, of downs. Sounds like you've really been down. I'm hearing a lot of pain and suffering. How are you managing that? Are you managing that at all? Oh, it sounds like you're not. And then you can ask the questions. Are you have you thought about ending your life? You know, just be open. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting how the things that we don't really, we feel scared or or like we shouldn't talk about are the things we absolutely should. <laughs> you know, it's very yeah. hard. And it, it definitely, there used to be this thought process that if you asked somebody if they were suicidal or if you asked somebody about suicide, that that would make them complete suicide because you would be giving them the idea. Um, but all of the research shows the exact opposite. When you ask somebody directly, have you been thought, having thoughts of wanting to die or to kill yourself? Um, what it actually does is it shows that person that somebody cares enough to ask the question, right? Because somebody in that space where they ultimately want to end their own lives is, at the place where they don't believe that anybody cares anymore. Yeah, that's powerful. So it's actually a signal to that person that I, I care enough about you to ask you. Yeah. This question. Yeah. Yeah, that's really something. And asking about it opens the doorway to be able to ask more questions and ultimately get somebody help. Okay. So. Well, just that alone is like worth the price of admission to this particular session. <laughs> and I really appreciate that. Yeah, I know there's many more points you, you want to make and I want to hear them, but that's just that one thing, just knowing to take the stigma out of asking directly a question that actually will make somebody feel like someone cares. Absolutely. Hugely. Absolutely. Um, oh, I wonder if I deleted it. There was this other quote that I really liked. Um, oh, here it is. Um, this is by Misty Von Allen. And I shared this quote on my Thrive Vibers presentation, but it says, when we recognize that someone is having suicidal thoughts and we reach out, we are instantly planting a seed of hope that they're not invisible, that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. I just think that's true and that's powerful. Yeah, that's amazing. People do feel invisible, don't they? Mm -hmm. And we all put on kind of the happy face and, and you know, forward facing. We look fine. We look happy. We look like everything's great. And it's it's just taking, what, that extra 30 seconds to kind of peek behind the mask, so to speak. You know, actually to ask... Uh, a question that is more truly caring than just, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, good. Huh. Yay. I'm, I'm off glad the hook. to hear I'm it. Good. Yeah, glad to hear that. Me too. I'm you off know. the hook for having to do anything about that. Yeah. Uh -huh. Absolutely. It's really good. It's really Absolutely. powerful. So we've kind of touched on some of the risk factors, but I think they're important to review as well. Um, and they kind of break down into that there's individual risk factors, relationship risk factors, community risk factors. Um, and so you're looking kind of at the whole person for what may put them at risk. 
some individual risk factors are if somebody's had a previous suicide attempt, that's a pretty big risk factor because we'll kind of get into the brain for a second. When we do something, it creates a pathway in our brain, right? And so if my brain will start to associate when I feel this emotion, then I can just kill myself. Done before. I've tried before, right? That's a pathway that's solid in the brain. That pathway will always be there now. And so when we get really heightened emotions, because that pathway is already there, our brain's going to go there as an option. And it sometimes can take a lot to pull yourself out of that. So previous suicide attempts are huge. That's a really big risk factor. Um, job loss, criminal problems. We see this a lot where you'll hear about somebody that was like a teacher who was arrested for sexually abusing their, you know, school children. And they've been arrested and in jail for two days and they kill themselves in jail. That's mm. not an uncommon thing to happen, unfortunately, right? We hear about people who become incarcerated that, or they're charged with something and they kill themselves because, you know, to them, their life is over now. So criminal charges yeah. are a huge one. Drug use is a big one. Um, impulsivity. Yeah. Get out of it yes. easily. Like often if you're probably incarcerated for something like that, that you feel like there's no hope for me, exactly. you know, then yeah. what's the point in sticking around? Yeah. And yet that's not generally actually true. There is hope. <laughs> yeah. But I can see that. Yeah. And I think the common thread for a lot of those things are the feelings of hopelessness, right? Mm -hmm. um, of I've lost my job, I've been arrested, I can't, I can't quit heroin or I can't quit meth. I, I want to be sober to get my kids back, but it just isn't happening. Um, you know, those are huge things that lead to feelings of hopelessness. Yeah. And serious illness, chronic pain is huge because regardless of how much work you do on your emotions, you're still going to have chronic pain. And that's a scary place to be, right? You talked about with your sister, and we hear this a lot within the mental health community. They're high risk because yeah. death, especially if you have any positive beliefs about an afterlife or anything like that, then death is a joyful piece that will relieve you from pain. And so suicide becomes a big option for those individuals. Um, and then violence and trauma towards an individual are a huge risk factor. They, I don't remember the exact statistic, but they've done studies on people who show up in an ER for like a crisis evaluation because they're suicidal. And it's, mm -hmm. I think it was over 50% of the people that showed up had like what we would consider significant trauma in their lives. So that's a huge mostly impact. related to kind of abuse, that yes. kind of trauma, like yeah. a, a severe trauma is considered physical, sexual. Yeah. Um, yeah. That makes sense to yeah. me yeah. completely. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, relationship risk factors. You brought up bullying. Bullying is huge, especially by your peers. And I mean, now with social media, Bullying can be so anonymous. And the things that people will say online are sometimes so much, a lot of times, so much worse than what they'll say to your face, right? Like Sally down the street at school may not tell me to my face at school that I should go die, that nobody loves me and I should just kill myself to make everybody else around me happy. But they'll post that online. They'll post it anonymously online. That's hard. And when th that's the images and the messages that you're getting, like, it's, it's really hard not to believe that to be true, right? If people are telling you constantly, you're a burden, everybody hates you, your family doesn't love you, you should go kill yourself. What do you think that person is going to do? It's just so awful. I just can't imagine saying that to another, you know, especially to a, from a young person to another young person. But I guess it's because your young person that's saying it is not developed enough to have the the forethought of the consequences of those words yeah and the person receiving it is also not able to 
process that, I mean, that's where it just feels like, oh my gosh, how, why would somebody, would someone say that, you know, it's just, or even if they don't say it that plainly, but just to say words like nobody loves you, nobody wants you, you're not, you're not important, you're, you know, you're invisible or you know, go back to being invisible or whatever those words are that just can crush mm -hmm. a young person. They can crush an adult. So can you imagine? I just am like, oh, my, my, my brain can hardly handle that, that that exists, but it exists everywhere. Because like you say, they can say the worst things through a text or an, uh, some way online to get a message to somebody. There's so many ways, you know, there's a million different apps now. It's not just a couple. There's so many ways. And I'm like, you can't even monitor all the ways that no. that this happens and, and, and is happening. And almost everybody that I talk to now, they're like, oh, my child went through some bullying by this one person this one year and, you know, and had these thoughts. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, this is terrible. Yeah, it's so uh, it's heartbreaking. Talking about, um, you know, asking the question of how could somebody do that, I often think about in my undergrad, I was a sociology major, and we read this book in one of my classes called Modernity and the Holocaust that talked about, it was kind of like um, the breakdown of how the Holocaust happened, right? And the steps that were, quite frankly, necessary to get to the point where so many people could be murdered. And one of the steps is the de was the dehumanization of Jews, right? Where you just, the propaganda and all of these things just talked about how they were less than and, and not people and the causes of all these diseases and, you know, all of these things. And so people started to view them as not being a person. And I think right. those are things that, those are themes that we still see. There's this phrase, what's common is common. Um, meaning that in you know human beings, technology may have changed or different things you know may change over the years and the centuries and the millennia, but human emotions and human nature has been pretty consistent. Um, right. And so we're all capable of being sad, being angry, being happy, being all of these things, and we're also capable of bringing people joy and bringing people pain, and we're all susceptible to these you know, to messages and propaganda and different things like that. And I think like when you have people online who are, you know, saying to their neighbor down the street, just kill yourself already. Nobody loves you. That individual has dehumanized that person to the point that they don't see them as a human being who's real with emotions and all those things. They don't see them that way anymore. That's how they can say something so horrible to them. You think that's pretty scary. Yeah that we can dehumanize others. You know, we see this at a celebrity level, at a political level, at a personal level, where, um, you know, somebody posts on Facebook, you know, their opinion about some political belief and people just attack, you're horrible, you're this, you're that. Because we're seeing people for their beliefs or their thoughts or the ideas rather than seeing them as a person. Yeah, because human beings are complex. I mean, yeah. we're all going to have different thoughts and beliefs and feelings about things depending on so many factors in our life and what we've been through and what we were taught as kids and how we grew up and, and how our, our community is right now, the people around us. And, you know, peer, peer pressure, it, it, it translates into adulthood. Yes, and this absolutely. is one of the ways... Yeah, that you you see it happening, and it is really true. It is like very, um, very, very important that as adults we can see what our own prejudices, what our own biases are, and know that 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 is not everyone's, and it should, and and that we not. I don't like to use the word should or shouldn't, but that. We have to realize as adults what we say, how we act, how we react to different things really affects our children or whoever are, are the people close to us. And that when we don't have the ability 
to see that we as a collective human race are going to be different. We're going to have differences. We're going to have different experiences and reasons for thinking the way that we do and to be able to give that kind of grace to people around us is a hugely important thing like it's a skill mm -hmm. that you have to train yourself to to just stop short of because I know I've gotten into a few <laughs> spitball fights you know for over different things and I'm just I go back I'm like why did you do that everybody has a right to their own opinion and their own thoughts Mostly it's when somebody asks a question and then you try to give your thoughts about something and that gets completely rejected that you're like, why did I open myself up that way? I should not have because they didn't really want to know what my thoughts and why I felt the way I did. They didn't really want to know. <laughs> I think yeah. that's a really interesting trap about a lot of our social media interactions is that I agree. Do they really want to know or were they just trying to stir the pot and find a way to, you know, spit in my face? <laughs> just, and, you yeah, know, trying to get their own ideas affirmed. Right. They want right. validation. Mm, yep. Sure. Exactly. And I think what it really boils down to is empathy, right? Building empathy. Mm -hmm. I think in times where we have hurt somebody's feelings and we've gone and said, I'm so sorry, I can't believe I did that. We want them to forgive us, right? We want to be given yeah. grace. And so it would make sense that if we want to be given grace for things that we do because we're human beings and we make mistakes, that other people might also want and deserve to be given grace. And it's that it goes both ways and it, it truly is developing empathy. And recognize, like I said, people are complex. And I think it's so easy online to see somebody as this like one facet, this one version, this like one dimensional, if you will. But you have to take a step back and realize this person probably believes what they do because of a million things, you know, in right. their lives. And that's okay. And does it really impact me that this person, you know, voted for this person? you know, this president or, or believes this about drugs or believes this about guns. Like, you know, does it really, although the, I know the gun thing is a really hot topic. <laughs> so, but, you know, truly at the end of the day, like, does it, does it really impact me that this person believes that, you know, in a lot of ways? And I know yeah. that that's kind of a sticky subject and I'm sure people could argue and say, well, yeah, because if they voted this way, then it will impact me this way. And that I understand, like, I understand that there's, that's real, I'm kind of simplifying a really complex thing. But also yeah. at the end of the day, it's so important to have empathy and recognize that another person also has feelings, emotions, and a life, right? Yeah. Ultimately, exactly. at the end of the day, we're all human beings. And right. that's important to recognize. Yeah. Um, yeah. 100% agree. And easier said than done sometimes when we have really passionate feelings about certain things. It's really, it's really hard. But, but I think when we can go back to that place where it used to be like, we can, we can all exist, coexist in the same space and have, you know, 10 people in the same room have 10 different ideas about how to get something done. And that's okay. You know, mm -hmm. maybe you just listen more. Because maybe that person's idea really is better than the one I came in the room with, you know? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know? I always think it's important for me to recognize that I'm not, I will never be the smartest person in the room, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think that any individual really is the smartest person in the room. I think we come up with our best ideas when we're collectively working because I'm going to come with thing, at things from my own bias. And somebody else's as well. So they may see blind spots that I have, and I may see blind spots that they have. And by working together, we can come up with like a great solution to something. So, yeah, I love that. I think that's really true. So, back to the suicide thing with, with people that have come to a place where they're just totally despondent, um, feel worthless, never listened to, not seen, not cared for. That one comment, that one question that says I care is, are you having suicidal thoughts? Mm -hmm. Are you struggling with this 
to the point where you've really wondered if maybe just checking out of this particular, you know, experience called life might be the option. Yeah. You know, something say so that you can hopefully open up a conversation. Yeah. And I think it's important to also kind of go into specifics of what that conversation will look like. Um, for example, when we, when we talk about the, the biggest thing to save somebody's life, when, if somebody is having significant suicidal thoughts, and we kind of talk about suicide on a spectrum, right? We have what we call more passive suicidal ideation. This is kind of these clinical terms here. Passive suicidal ideation is where it's the thought of, I wish I could go to sleep and not wake up, right? I just want the pain to end. And then at yeah. the other end, we have active suicidal ideation. And that is where somebody has, they actively want to die. They have a plan and they're going to they're gonna do that plan, right? So we call them actively suicidal with intent and a plan. They have intent to die and they have a plan on how they're going to do it. And they are going to act on it, right? They're like 10 out of 10, I'm going to do it. And someone can be anywhere on that spectrum. And right. I think as you're having conversations with people, you know, listen. And if they say, yeah, I am having suicidal thoughts. Okay, can I ask, have you thought about ways that you want to die? Like how you might do that? And if they say, well, I thought about a couple things. Okay, can you tell me what those things are? And why we're doing that is we're kind of having this conversation about safety, right? And there are different ways that people try to complete suicide. Statistically speaking, women or um, girls are more likely to overdose and take medications. And men are more likely to um, use firearms. So, and I think that's one of the disparities between the fact that men complete suicide more than women. There, it's still a pretty low percentage of people that overdose actually die. Um, yeah. Th just to be very candid about it, they don't take the right medication or they don't take enough medication to kill right. themselves. Whereas a gunshot, it's one and done, right? There's no going back. There's no vomiting up in medication. There's no getting charcoal or pumping their stomach at the hospital. There is no option. It's just death. Um, yeah. Even somebody who attempts to hang themselves, if somebody walks in on them after a minute, they'll likely survive that person well, whereas a gunshot, once again, is the same thing. And so when you are talking to family or friends or people in your lives, you know, ask them, do you have any guns in your home? And if they say yes, offer. Would you be okay if, if I watch those for a little while until you're in a better place? You know, or could we, could we get dad to come pick up your guns for a while until you feel safe? Or can we lock up your medications? Some medications, 100% necessary. You have to take them to survive. Those are also medications that if you take too much could kill you. And so would it be okay if I take your medications and just give you your pill every morning? You know, I'm worried about your safety. Um, yeah. And if somebody, is said, if somebody says, no, you can't do that, I'm going to do it, I'm going to kill myself tonight, then at that point, they need to go to a hospital. And so you can call 911 and somebody, and they'll bring them to a hospital to get help. Or sometimes you might be able to convince them to get in the car with you. But, you know, you kind of can see, like, if they're, if they're on the fence about it, hey, can I, can I take some things from you? So we can be safe. Let me help you find a therapist. Let me help you with A, B, C, or D. But if they can't even see past anything and they're just so committed to dying, then it's the time that they need to go to a hospital and see somebody like me who will get them the help that they need so that they can be safe. One of the biggest indicators for saving somebody's life is decreasing their access. Oftentimes, the high majority of people they're not 100% suicidal 100% of the time, right? It ebbs and flows. And they may have a pretty good day. And then something happens or they have this thought and they're like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to do it, right? 
But if they don't have anything to do it with, that emotion is eventually going to come down. We call it riding the wave of emotion. That emotion will eventually come down and they'll be less likely. So the more time that we can put between their thought of I'm going to kill myself and their access to lethal means, as we call it, is the biggest indicator on saving somebody's life. And that's why we ask the questions. Can I take your guns? Can I lock up your meds? Give me your belt. Take away the rope. Mm -hmm. So it's really, truly about time, giving time for the emotion, that crisis mode that they're in when they're like, I'm doing this to have that dissipate or lessen to a place where they can maybe hear other yeah. words from a therapist or from a, a, even just somebody who cares or whatever it, it's going to take to make the the brain switch, you mm -hmm. know. But if somebody talks about suicide over and over again and throughout, you know, it's almost like I I I know one situation where it was like, it was like talked about all the time. So you finally just get to the point where you're just like, okay, <laughs> you know, I don't know how to help you anymore. I don't know how to talk about this anymore. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain um, like condition that certain people just can't switch that off? And w is there any way to know, you know, I mean, I wish the pupils in the eyes dilated or, yeah. you know, and to know like oh this is serious and oh this is just talk you know and not that I mean I would always take it serious no matter what if a person said something to me but but there was just one situation and, and it was like all the people around this person just kind of got tired of hearing about it it was almost just like oh here we go again any suggestions on how yeah. to deal with that or what to how to how to process that for yourself so that you don't just check them off your list like, oh, no big deal. They do this every day, you know? Um, there definitely are several diagnosable mental illnesses that have an increased rate of suicide. Bipolar disorder is one. Um, and what's challenging about bipolar disorder is that somebody completing suicide can happen at either a manic phase or a depressed phase right? It can happen at both. Because when you're manic, um, you're really, really impulsive, right? You're kind of like just running at 5 million miles a minute and that impulsivity is really high. Um, and when you're depressed, you're severely depressed, right? And so then, you know, you might think that this is the time to die. And another one that's really big is borderline personality disorder. Um, and that is one where you, people especially will make a lot of comments of, I just want to die. I'm just going to kill myself. I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to do that. And what's scary about that one as well is that the impulsivity is really high. And that's what's hard about teenagers and kids is their brain is not developed all the way yet. And kids are very right. impulsive and teens are very impulsive. It's just is the nature of their brains. And so, you know, that's why we, we take suicide so seriously, especially among those populations and of course older, but um, I think for people that are what we would maybe say chronically suicidal or say those things, um, those people need to be getting professional help, right? And I think you can you can kind of learn with them. Their their therapist will work with them on creating safety plans and the things that they need to do. And if you have somebody that's you know every day, I just want to kill myself. I'm just going to die you might have to set boundaries in your lives, right? Um, I know that in my personal life, I had somebody that was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder who almost every day would message me on Facebook and say, like in Messenger, say that she wanted to die and she wanted to kill herself. And it eventually got to the point, like, you know, I would just reiterate over and over again, like, you need, okay, call your therapist, call your therapist, call your therapist. Um, and eventually, unfortunately, I had to just stop responding because it, it got too much. And yeah. sometimes we have to create those really unfortunate boundaries in our lives. You know, and it, it, what's, what's hard is that for that situation, I wasn't related to this person, right? She was somebody I didn't know very well, quite frankly. Yeah. But, you know, what if this is your child? What if this is your mom? What if this is this other person? And I think creating 
we have to create healthy boundaries and we have to try to encourage that person to get the help that they need. It's a person's ultimate responsibility as well to make sure that they're getting the help that they need. And with somebody who's chronically suicidal, they need to see a therapist and their therapist will work with them on creating a plan, right? And sometimes you can be engaged if you are the mother of a child that's constantly suicidal, you should be engaged in that safety plan and know what that safety plan is. That safety plan should be done with you so that you know when your kid's bringing something up, you know, or say you live with your mom and your mom is the one who's constantly expressing suicidal thoughts. If you are, you know, part of their care team, their family, you should be engaged in those safety planning things. Because at the end of the day, when somebody is at that level, um, that's outside the scope of a normal person's ability to deal with right yeah because you don't know what to do or what to say at some point yeah. and so being involved in a care plan for before or knowing that this could or has been you know expressed or a problem before this is how the care plan is going to go you know that at least gives you kind of a system or a, a, a something to do you know like here's the next step do this you know because that's I think the worst part is just the unknown and not knowing, yeah. you know, what, <clears throat> how I handle this, you know, mm -hmm. that's really good. And bringing someone to the hospital and calling the police. They also have, um, I don't know exactly when I was instituted, but it's the numbers 988. Let me make sure I'm not lying about yeah, it's that. relatively new, the suicide hotline. Yeah. So they recently changed it. So you just have to dial 988 on the phone. It's like dialing 911. And it directs you right to the suicide line. It's available 24-7. Encourage people to use it, right? Yeah. Um, if you get a text at one in the morning where, you know, one of your chronically suicidal friends is like, I am suicidal, I need help. Tell them text 988, right? And if ultimately you're concerned about them, then call the police and have them do what's called a welfare check. And they can go check on that person and get them the help that they need. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate and concern about the level of mental health training that police have and police are, you know, I know that Salt Lake City, for example, where I live, um, have hired social workers in their police department to go out to mental health calls with them. So I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, as time goes on, um, the mental health training will improve. But, you know, my spouse who used to be in law enforcement was often called and they do get some levels of training, but even just having somebody intervene if somebody is that suicidal is huge, right? They may not handle the situation oh, yeah. perfectly, but they're still going to save their life. And yeah. it gives them the opportunity to get the help that they need. And I think that's, you know, that's the most important thing in that moment. Exactly. Just again, that gives them time, even if it isn't the perfect, per you know, situation or they don't have all the perfect knowledge or whatever, you're somebody, you're yeah. somebody that's there, you know, to to respond, to say don't, or to stop you, uh, just to give time again. I think that's really a huge takeaway from this conversation, that the person just needs time because a lot of times they will come to that next, the next, you know, thought of like, oh, I'm, I'm so glad that I didn't do that and yeah. I have so much to live for, but it doesn't happen in that moment. No. And so they need time. Yeah. Yeah. Time is the biggest factor for sure, mm. for sure. And definitely, I mean, encourage people to get the help that they need, right? Like somebody who is having suicidal thoughts got there for a reason. They have a lot of, a lot of stuff that they need to unpack and really work yeah. on. And a therapist can help them with all of those things, right? Um, right. I think one of the most incredible or some of the most incredible stories that I, I hear are people who have failed suicide attempts um, mm. where they try to take their lives that didn't work or they were about to and someone talked them out of it and they look back five years later and are like, I'm so grateful mm. that, that person stopped me because like, look at where I'm at now, you know? And it's hard because when somebody is in that dark place, it's very much a tunnel vision right? You firmly believe that it's hopeless, right? There, nothing will get better. Uh, right. But ultimately, when we can take 10 steps back or 20 steps back from a hard situation, we know that things 
have the potential to get better. It might, it'll be hard work, but things right. can and do get better and things change over time. But people don't, yeah. people don't really see that sometimes. I think another important part to, or point to bring up is, you know, there was this idea for so long that suicide is the most selfish thing that somebody can do. Um, because we look at it from our perspective of, right, like that person took their lives, like look at all the pain they brought me. But when somebody is that suicidal and they firmly believe that they need to die, to them, that is the most selfless thing they can do. Because what they believe to their core is that they're a burden and that everybody's life will be better without them. It's not logical and it's not rational, but I think it's important to recognize that that is someone's thought process when they kill themselves, is that mm. I am taking this, this burden, me as a burden, I'm taking this off of the people around me so that they can go on and live a happy life because yeah. all I do is, you know, bring them down or whatever. And so... I think changing that narrative is important in our society that these people aren't selfish, right? Suicide didn't kill them. Sadness killed them. They died by sadness. And they truly believe that they are the burden and that they are helping everybody around them. I think that's such a good um, and important point is like, I remember when I was younger, that was sort of the, the way people would frame suicide. Well, they're just uh, so selfish because look at the pain it's left behind for everybody else and they got out of it or whatever. And and I remember sometimes cringing at that sort of like, well, I don't I don't think that they were trying to be selfish. I think they were they were desperate. They were sad. They were lonely. They were whatever. They were abused. There was something going on, you know. And so it's good to hear that that now is like, that's more correct in, you know, the, the definition or whatever, just because if we can change that narrative, I mean, that's just one more reason for somebody to go, well, I'm selfish anyway. I might as well, you know what I mean? It, to me, it's just, it's like adding one more log on the fire. Yeah. And so I like that, that you brought that up here at the end of our conversation on this, because so often, and I definitely think this happens a lot in, in um, sort of religious communities where they kind of lean towards that because there's been such a stigma like if you do that then you know there's no redemption for you like if you believe in life after death if you kill yourself well that's it you know you murdered somebody yourself you know and so murder is like this horrid thing that they have named suicide and it's just inappropriate it's just not even in the same vein although I know some people who have actually had people say that to them uh, when they had a child or somebody commit suicide. And I just think that's so sad. What a terrible thing, mm -hmm. you know, to say to a loved one um, because there's just no way that they were in that moment mentally sound. No. They weren't. Oh, you know, absolutely they were not. Yeah. yeah. I remember, oh, I think I was a junior. I was a sophomore or a junior in high school. Um, I think it was a junior. Mm, doesn't matter. But we had a teacher complete suicide in the middle of a school week. Um, not at the school, luckily, but she did complete suicide. And I remember there were these two girls that were talking about it. And I overheard them. And they're like, the saddest part is that she's going straight to hell. Oh. Right? That's like the day that we find out that she, that this teacher killed herself. And that's their comment is, oh, the saddest part is she's going straight to hell. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I think that oh, wow. that old way of thinking needs needs to go. Yes, because, it definitely does. Yeah, that's not helpful, regardless of what somebody believes about right the afterlife or if there is one. Um, that's never the right thing to say to somebody mm -hmm. or about somebody. Yeah. No, it just isn't, and it just doesn't. It doesn't help any of the people around that person no. that, are, that are here still trying to deal with all of their own guilt, you know, because that's what people do. I mean, I would if I were the parent of, of, of a child that, you know, that completed suicide. I would be like riddled with 
how could I have done this better? What did I do wrong? Or, you know, it's like, it's just the worst thing to do to somebody that's already dealing with the death of someone they love, you know? So that's a really, that's a really um, very wise and wonderful way to wrap this up. Are there any, are there any other things that are left floating out there that you want to comment on before we, we finish off this podcast episode? It's always such a, a wonderful conversation with you, Alyssa. Thank you so much. Yeah, there is one more thing. And I, this is kind of a, I'll say it, this is kind of a double-edged sword statement. And I'll explain my thoughts after I say it. But when I was in graduate school, as clinicians and therapists, um, they talk about it's not a matter of if you'll have a client that completes suicide, it's about a matter of when. And I remember one of my teachers kind of blanket told us, you can't talk someone into suicide and you can't talk someone out of it. Meaning if somebody is, wow. is that committed to it, there may not be a whole lot that you can do. And that, that being said, like always try, ask the questions, all of those things. But I think you kind of brought this up when some, everybody that has someone in their life who dies by suicide feels guilt. If I had only done this, if I had only done that, this person wouldn't have died. If I'd asked the questions, if I'd seen the signs, then my son and daughter might still be alive if I hadn't gone to the store. Um, I had picked up the phone. If I had if I, taken the casserole to my neighbor, yeah. whatever, you know, if like that. That yeah. our mom or dad or son yeah. or daughter, then, you know, this loved one wouldn't have killed themselves. And what it ultimately boils down to is that may not be the case, actually. There may not be. Right. There may not be. I have had... I, I can't tell you how many crisis evals I've done on, and I, you know, I work, um, I'm in pediatrics, so they're all under the age of 18. And I, yeah. I'll see, I'll have kids that, you know, attempt to um, die by ingestion, right? And it, it doesn't work. And I, I have to ask them the question, how do you feel about still being alive? And some kids are like, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful it didn't work, right? Yeah. But there are kids that are that will say, I'm so upset. They're angry. They're upset. They're angry that they're still alive, you know? Yeah. And for those kids, I sometimes think it's it's maybe not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Like, I hope you get the help you need to stop yourself. But sometimes, um, sometimes yeah. somebody's emotions and mental illness takes their life, right? Right. And absolutely. And it's, it's horrible and it's so sad and it's unbelievably tragic that somebody gets to that place. But, and it's, I tell families this when, when I have death by suicide, I'll tell them yeah. it's normal that it's very normal that you feel guilty and it's not right. It's, you know, like just because you feel that way doesn't mean that's true. Right. Because it's that, that's how it is. Right. You know, you can be the best parent in the world. We have, um, so Lone Peak High School is one of our top achieving high schools in Utah. Great sports, great academics, all of the things. And they've had a pretty disproportionate number of suicides in the school, right? These are kids with straight A's that have football scholarships or basketball scholarships or they're the star of the baseball team that are killing themselves. And parents are like, what could I have done differently? You know, and ultimately at the end of the day, maybe there's not a lot. And, it's, and that's tragic and that's so sad, but I hope that it absolves somebody of guilt, right? You didn't cause this person to kill themselves. Their emotions and their mental health caused them to kill themselves. Um, oh, that's really, that's a really good thing to remember at the end of this, you know, conversation that is that where their emotions are, where their mental health is, that's what caused it. Not you being different or doing something that you didn't do or, and, and what, what kind of guilt that is left behind in you is that trauma that you have to overcome if you're having those feelings, because that can be so traumatic. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I do, I do know parents who, have had suicide in their, in their, among their children. And it's just like so devastating, but that's what you're saying. You can't take that guilt 
It's not yours to have. It was the situation of their emotions and what they could or couldn't maneuver through according to their mental health and their mental state at that time. Exactly. Oh, I really appreciate this conversation. You're so wonderful to not only to come on the podcast and have these, um, you know, heartfelt conversations about hard things that are hard to talk about, but at the end of it, you always have this wonderful way of summing something up so that everyone that is left in the conversation knows how to proceed, whether it's to help a friend or a child or a loved one by saying in plain language or by, can I hold on to your pills or your gun or can somebody else do that? You know, can we, can we give you the time, you know, can we get you the right therapist, all of that. And then if it does happen to also give people that absolution of their own, you know, guilt or what ifs, you know, because you can't control it. And um, I really appreciate those thoughts. And please, will you come again? We'll have another subject, I'm sure. Of course. (laughs) Always happy to be here. Oh, it's wonderful. Well, thank you again for for being um, so willing to, you know, add that expertise and that and that conversational way that you have of talking about things like this that helps all of us be able to deal with, you know, the challenges of our own lives in in our own ideation and in the in that moment when we also need to remember, give yourself a little more time. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Jan. Thank you, Alyssa.